Uh, welcome to the GSSI Research Doesn't Stop webinar series. I'm Alessandro Palma, uh, GSSI faculty, and I will chair today's session. Uh, with this meeting, we conclude uh, the third webinar series. Uh, we're already working uh, the fourth series, which is going to start soon after the Easter break. Uh, today, I'm particularly glad and honored to chair this session with Tatiana De Rugino. Tatiana, let me first say thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, Tatiana doesn't need any lengthy introduction. She's a world's leading author on topics related with environmental and public economics, uh, with a special focus on the consequence of natural disasters and environmental externalities. She received a PhD from MIT. She is currently associate professor at the University of Illinois and MBR research associate. And today she's going to present a paper on pollution and mortality using historical data. Um, as usual, uh, before starting, let me summarize the rules. Tatiana, you have one hour to present your paper. Um, attendees, please mute your microphone and let Tatiana have a smooth presentation. If you have spot questions and brief clarifications, raise your hand. But considering that we, we're going to have a long uh, time for a long discussion just uh, after the presentation. Um, I will collect questions for those who attend the seminar, the, the webinar, sorry, here on Zoom, uh, while Fabiano Companucci will collect questions uh, for those who are uh, who attending the, 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 the webinar on our, our live stream um, on the official GSSI YouTube channel. And uh, last but not least, I must inform you that the webinar is going to be recorded. So those of you who prefer not to be recorded uh, can leave Zoom now and keep on following the webinar on the GSSI YouTube channel. Um, I think that's all. So Tatiana, I give you the floor. Have a good presentation. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here in, uh, in spirit and, and virtually. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, this is joint work with my colleague, uh, Julian Reif. And as the title suggests, we're looking at pollution and mortality in the United States from 1972 to 1988. This is still very much in work, a work in progress. So any and all feedback is welcome. Uh, so for anyone who's worked in this area, yeah. Uh, you should know that estimating the long run effects of air pollution is difficult. Uh, you might see numbers floated about uh, like the one from the World Health Organization saying that ambient air pollution caused 3 million premature deaths in 2012. Where do these numbers come from? They largely come from epidemiological studies that correlate air pollution exposure with mortality. Um, but economists have long recognized that there's a number of issues with interpreting these correlations causally, even when you control for any number of confounding factors, because there's still the question of what is generating the residual variation in air pollution, and might that be itself correlated with mortality? So might there be an omitted variable bias? So economists have uh, jumped on this bandwagon with quasi-experimental uh, studies, a number of which you see listed here. A downside of these is that they typically focus on mortality or health over a time period of one year or even uh, less. And the problem with that is then you do not know how mortality is affected beyond that one year period. Uh, and that's where the long run effects question comes in. Now, there are some studies that try to get at the longer health effects of air pollution exposure. The four I'm aware of are listed here. And again, this is in the quasi-experimental uh, literature now. One of them uh, looks at dementia rather than mortality. Two of them use the same um, discontinuity in China uh, in the heating policy right across the Huai River. And one of them looks at the acid rain program in the United um, States. So these kind of studies are few and far between. Why is this so difficult? Well, first, uh, to study the long run effects of air pollution in a quasi-experimental setting, you need quasi-experimental variation in uh, air pollution. Uh, and that the, uh, variation is often difficult to come by. 
But perhaps even more importantly, you also need to be able to estimate the health effect of air pollution controlling for other intervening factors in the middle, right? So what we'd like for policy purposes is to know you're exposed to air pollution, how does that harm your long-term health? But in response to air pollution exposure, you might move, which could moderate uh, this effect on health. Uh, you could also suffer labor market consequences, which again could affect how uh, your health is affected. And the problem with that is, is at the extreme, suppose that people react to air pollution exposure by making offsetting investments in health. You might find that on net health is not affected, but of course this doesn't mean that air pollution is not harmful in the long run because you had to make these investments, costly investments, in order to undo the health effects of air pollution. So we'd really like this piece of the puzzle to be able to make informed policy choices, but this is difficult to do because of all these other things that could be going on, and also because of the need to follow a person over a long period of time, which is difficult uh, in many data sets. Now, in this paper, we don't have a source of uh, we, we don't have a solution to these problems directly. Instead, our research question is, what can we learn about the long run effects of air pollution exposure from shorter run estimates? And so we're gonna have a two-step approach. First, we're gonna have a quasi-experimental setting where we use quasi-experimental variation to estimate the mortality effects of acute sulfur dioxide or SO2 exposure for different people in different age groups, uh, our setting is the United States over the time period 1972 to 1988. Um, in principle, if we get access to confidential data, which will happen when the research data centers of the Census Bureau open up, we can extend our uh, data series to cover through 2015. Uh, but for now, we're using publicly available data, which ends in 1988. After we obtain these quasi-experimental estimates, we're gonna combine them with the latent health model of Yaris, Mooney, and Moreau, and use that calibrated model to infer a long-run mortality effects. So we're basically combining quasi-experimental and structural estimates to say something about what pollution does to long-run health. Once we fit that model, we're gonna be able to use it to estimate a number of counterfactuals. For example, the one I'm gonna show you today is by how much does a one unit increase in SO2 lower life expectancy. Now, uh, in terms of our contributions to literature, one is methodological. So we, uh, steps one and two in the previous slide, help us to develop a methodology to infer long run effects of really any kind of environmental shock from shorter run estimates. Now, the original mortality latent health model is not ours, but we developed the methodology to translate shorter run estimates into uh, longer run effects. Uh, second, we obtained causal estimates of the effects of SO2 exposure on the entire US population over 1972 to 1988. Another drawback of the previous studies is that they typically focus on only one group of individuals or on only one geographic uh, area or in a fairly short time period. By contrast, our estimates encompass the majority of the US population and a fairly large uh, time period. Um, this methodology is built on a previous paper by me and my co-authors, which has been published in 2019. That paper focused on fine particulate matter uh, and the elderly population in the time period 1999. 2013. So uh, this study is kind of like the second large scale study in the United uh, States. Uh, additionally, we also shed light on the long run benefits of the decline in SO2 over this time period. So ultimately, we're going to use our estimates to answer a question like, what share of the increase in life expectancy during this time period can be attributed to reductions in air pollution, something that at this point, we don't have a very good answer to. Just to give you a brief preview of the results, uh, we find that a one day, one part per billion increase in SO2, which is about 10% of the mean, increases same day mortality by 0.07 deaths per million. 
we find that the effect of this one-day increase grows over time and converges to about 0.18 deaths per million after three to four weeks. And I'll explain why that's significant when I go through the estimates. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, we find that most of the increased deaths are due to cardiovascular causes and are concentrated among the oldest individuals in our sample. Finally, our calibrated model suggests that a permanent one unit increase in SO2 decreases life expectancy by about 0.6 to 0.7 years, although I should stress that this estimate is still preliminary. To give you some background on uh, air pollution, in case you don't work in this area, the United States Environmental Protection Agency regulates six air pollutants, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, lead, particulate matter, and sulfur dioxide, which is our focus. Why do we focus on sulfur dioxide? Because it's measured well over a large number of counties during our 1972, 1988 uh, time period. Sulfur dioxide is regulated both at the daily and annual levels. So a county is not supposed to exceed a certain daily threshold. And it's also supposed to stay below some uh, specified annual average. Now, Sulfur dioxide is related to another pollutant called fine particulate matter, or PM2.5. Uh, and I'll explain how they're related as I explain their um, health uh, effects. So sulfur dioxide is known to negatively affect respiratory function. Some of this is done by exposing healthy volunteers to either really clean air or ambient air and measuring their cardiovascular um, activity. Uh, it's also been linked to cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, SO2, importantly, is also a precursor to a particle called sulfate. And sulfate is an important component of fine particulate matter and PM2.5. Uh, PM2.5 exposure in turn can also impair respiratory and cardiovascular function. And it's been uh, linked to various diseases, including cancer and cognitive uh, decline. Interestingly, PM2.5 exposure has also been linked to increased cellular aging. For example, shorter telomeres, which is one indicator that your cells have aged because telomeres get shorter with every cell um, reproduction. So what does this mean? First, it means that both sulfur dioxide and PM2.5 are likely to have immediate effects on health, as well as delayed and latent health effects. And this is important because if they didn't have latent health effects, we wouldn't need our uh, long run model, we could simply multiply our short run estimates by whatever time period we want to focus on. Second, when I show you the estimates for sulfur dioxide, they will implicitly include the health effects of sulfate because sulfur dioxide converts to sulfate over time uh, in the atmosphere. Now, in principle, we could look at PM2.5 and SO2 separately. In practice, PM2.5 was not widely monitored until 1999. So unfortunately, there is no way for us to separate between these two pollutants. However, because SO2 always converts to sulfate, arguably we're estimating something that's highly policy um, relevant. Here's what's been happening with SO2 levels since the 1970s. So SO2 monitoring started in 1972. And at that point, the average concentration in, across all the monitors was um, about 18 parts per billion. Since then, these levels have fallen dramatically. By the end of our current simple, sample period, uh, 1988, they'd fallen to about seven parts per billion. And by 2015, they had fallen to under two parts per billion on average. Now, some of this change is potentially because of the change in where sulfur dioxide is monitored. So the red dashed line shows you the fraction of the population that lives in an area where SO2 is monitored. That's changed somewhat over time. Uh, but even today, the majority of people live in a place that does have a sulfur dioxide um, monitor. So it is really important to understand what consequences has this decline had for mortality in order to understand whether we are implementing the best possible policy when it comes to uh, SO2. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the data that we use. 
Um, our monitor level pollution data come from EPA's air quality system. As the previous graph suggests, it's not available for all counties. Not all counties monitor sulfur dioxide, and that's going to be the limiting factor in the final size of our sample. We're going to be using quasi-experimental variation uh, in the form of wind direction. And so to that end, we obtain wind direction and wind speed data from the Japan Meteorological Agency uh, six-hour reanalysis data. Now, this is a gridded data set at a 1.25 by 1.25 degree resolution. That's almost 140 kilometers, so it's pretty coarse. And I'll explain why that's actually not a bad thing for our instrument and, in fact, may be a good thing. Um, because we are concerned that wind direction might be correlated with other atmospheric factors that may themselves affect mortality, we're going to be controlling for temperature and precipitation using data from PRISM interpolated to the daily level by Schlenker and Laura Roberts uh, 2009. Um, some of these data are sub-county level. For example, sometimes you can have multiple pollution monitors in a county uh, and the grid can obviously span uh, counties. So we aggregate or interpolate when, depending on what's appropriate, uh, to the county day uh, level, all of these uh, data sets. Um, our mortality and population data for the same time period come from two sources. The mortality data are from the National Centers for Health Statistics. It contains the exact date of death, the county in which the death occurred, and the age, sex, and race of the person who died. Uh, to calculate the death rate, we use annual county level population data from the Survey of Epidemiology and, and Results, or uh, SEER. After constructing the daily mortality rate, we merge this, these data with the environmental data at the county day level, uh, which results in a specification with two, about 2 million observations, uh, including observation, only observations where we have SO2 readings. Now, let me talk through the intuition and the details of our instrument. So it's long been known that wind currents can carry pollutants for hundreds of miles um, slash kilometers. Uh, the EPA has shown, for example, in 2004, that in many large cities in the US, the regional contribution to local sulfate concentrations is much higher than the local contribution. And again, sulfate is what sulfur dioxide turns into in the atmosphere over uh, time. Uh, so here you see a list of uh, fairly large US uh, cities and the um, paler yellow uh, denotes the regional contribution of uh, sulfates in micrograms per meter cubed. And then the brighter yellow denotes the local contribution. And basically what you see is that a lot of the measured sulfates in these cities are coming from outside of these um, cities uh, being carried by the wind. Um, another advantage of wind-based transport is that it can also address measurement error concerns. So air pollution monitors um, are, maybe a county will have one or two, and the measurement error problem is that if people aren't living right next to the monitors, which most are not, then the variation in pollution that you see at the monitor might not correspond to the average variation in the county. And that will create measurement error problems, which if the measurement error is classical, will give you an estimate that's too small, even if there's no confounding factors when it comes to the variation in pollution. Okay, so how do we utilize uh, wind transport as an instrument? We're gonna focus on wind direction, which we can show is strongly related to air pollution. Our key insight, which builds on Darugana et al. 2019, is that it's actually not necessary to pinpoint the pollution source. All we need for a valid instrument is a strong first stage and a plausible uh, satisfaction of the exogeneity of the orthogonality assumption, which we'll argue we have uh, here. Now, what's a benefit of not having to pinpoint the pollution source? Well, you minimize the data requirements. Um, during this time period in the US, for example, there's not a good inventory of all the pollution sources. So modeling transport from source to destination 
would be require probably compiling new data sets uh, or using data sets that are not um, complete. It would also be computationally very burdensome, especially if you wanted to take into account um, atmospheric chemistry, how the pollutants are changed as they travel over um, space. So uh, additionally, it maximizes the size of our estimation sample because again, all we need is wind direction data and pollution uh, data. Our identifying assumption is that wind direction is unrelated to health except through pollution, conditional on the environmental controls that we uh, include, which I'll show you um, in a little bit. So we're gonna construct our instrument by first using a clustering algorithm to assign pollution monitors to 100 regional um, groups. We're gonna allow pollution transport patterns to vary across these groups, because as you might imagine, wind blowing from the West can have a very different effect in California, um, where the West is the ocean, than in Massachusetts, which has the ocean to the East. Our first stage is going to consist of a group-specific relationship between wind direction and um, pollution. And then to minimize computational requirements, we're going to convert wind direction to uh, radians, uh, which I'll call theta. And then as our measures of wind direction, we're going to use the sine of theta and the sine of theta over 2, which is going to allow us to have flexible yet smooth relationships between wind direction and changes in the local uh, SO2 concentrations. And in case you don't remember your uh, signs, which I certainly uh, did not, uh, the x-axis here shows you theta, which in radians goes from zero to two pi. And then the black dashed line is the sine of theta. So it ranges from one to negative one and has this pattern from zero to uh, two pi. And then the red line is the sine of theta over two, which basically just goes from a zero to one. And of course, we're gonna allow for coefficients um, on these functions. So they can be, the coefficients can be negative and there can be various linear combinations of sine theta and sine theta over two. We're just gonna let the data tell us what that is. So to give you an illustrative example of how um, well our instrument captures pollution transport, here's one of the 100 monitor groups. This is around the Chicago, Illinois uh, area. So the black dots here on the map on the right represent individual pollution monitors. And the graph on the left represents the estimated relationship between wind direction and changes in sulfur dioxide concentrations. Uh, so the black line consists of a regression where the independent variables are indicators for wind direction falling into one of 35 10 degree wind direction bins where wind blowing from the west is the omitted category. And then the black dashed line overlays our sign fit onto this flexibly parametrized curve. Here we're controlling for minimum and maximum temperature, precipitation, and wind speed um, very flexibly, as I'll explain in a couple of slides, as well as county and month by year fixed effects. So these are changes in SO2 concentrations as the wind direction changes. So what do we notice? Uh, well, the highest relative concentration occur when the wind is blowing from the south uh, or the east. So here in the south, there's quite a few uh, coal-fired power plants, definitely over the time period that we're studying, as there are uh, in the east. By contrast, SO2 concentrations are lowest when the wind is blowing from the west and the north. These areas are relatively sparsely populated, um, as is so Canada is up north um, here. So not only is this relationship very strong, but it's also capturing reasonable patterns of where we would expect the pollution to be uh, coming from. Of course, we're not gonna explicitly model where it's coming from. I should also note that the magnitudes here are not small. Um, so the difference between the largest coefficient here and the smallest one here is about two and a half parts per billion, um, which is 
over 25% um, of the mean in our sample. So this is quite substantial uh, variation in air pollution. Uh, here's another monitor group. This is in the Los Angeles uh, area. It's same regression, but for a different group. Here we see largest SO2 concentrations when the wind is blowing from the east, which again is a fairly industrial area uh, when it comes to these monitor groups. The lowest concentrations is when the wind is blowing from the southwest, which is uh, the ocean. Now, I'll say not all monitor groups exhibit a strong statistical relationships. Uh, some of them do not, but many um, do. And these are the ones that are going to be um, identifying our mortality effects. So now let me go through the first stage, the exact first stage specification. On the left-hand side, we have sulfur dioxide concentration in county C on day D and month M in year Y. And our key set of instruments are indicator variables for County C falling into monitor group G, and there's 100 of these monitors that or monitor groups that we're adding up across, uh, times sine of uh, theta uh, plus same indicator multiplied by sine of theta over two. So beta 1G and beta 2G are going to be uh, the key first stage coefficients. There's 200 of them, so we're not going to um, plot them. Um, but that is what they um, are. Uh, we're going to have some controls here, uh, X prime CDMY that I'll explain on the next slide. And then we're going to control for county by month by year fixed effects and cluster our standard errors at the county level. So specifically, these controls will be two leads and two lags of the instrument uh, because wind direction is auto uh, correlated. So we want to make sure that auto correlation is not affecting our second stage estimates. Uh, we're also going to control for contemporaneous minimum and maximum temperatures, precipitation, and wind speed uh, in the following way. For every county, we're going to calculate county-specific percentile cutoffs for uh, daily minimum and maximum temperature, precipitation, and wind speed. Now, for temperature, we care about controlling for low temperatures and high temperatures, mostly, because these are the temperatures uh, that have been shown to be related to mortality. So uh, we have the following county-specific uh, percentile cutoffs. Essentially, we're going to be controlling for minimum and maximum temperatures being between the zeros and the first percentile, between the first and the fifth, between the fifth and the tenth. And then here, because these are moderate temperatures, we're going to widen our bins, control for an indicator for minimum temperatures being between the 10th and 25th, 25th and 75th, and so on. And then as again, as we get to uh, high temperatures, we're going to make the percentiles more finely grained to make sure that we're really controlling for um, any influence of those um, extremes. So this is going to give us nine indicator variables for minimum temperatures and nine indicator variables for maximum temperatures. For precipitation, we're going to use um, slightly different cutoffs. Um, we're going to have a really wide bin for pre daily precipitation following between the 0th and the 75th percentile, because that basically corresponds to little or no precipitation. And then here we're going to control for extreme, um, more extreme uh, precipitation. Uh, for wind, we're going to have six percentile cutoffs, again, between the 0 and the 25th percentiles that's essentially no wind, which could actually be bad for health if it's a really hot uh, day um, it, and uh, it's humid because wind in that case uh, can cool you off. Uh, then 25th to 75th, uh, which is, you know, kind of low, comfortable um, wind speed. And then for more extreme um, wind speeds here as well. Um, now, once we form these indicators, we're then going to form uh, indicators for all realized combinations of minimum and maximum temperature precipitation and wind speed, uh, giving us a total of about 1,900 possible indicator variables for different combinations. In practice, only 1,000 combinations are realized in our data set, but basically we're going to be controlling for 1,000 weather fixed effects in each of our regressions. Uh, our second stage specification 
is going to have as the dependent variable, the death rate over K days, starting from day D. So the death rate uh, over K days includes deaths on days DMY through DMY plus K minus one. So if we wanna calculate the 28 day death rate, we're gonna add up the death rate starting from today, going through 27 days from now. Uh, the key, of course, independent variable will be the predicted SO2 concentrations from the first stage. And then we're going to control for uh, the same fixed effects as in the first stage. Um, and as we extend K, we're also going to extend our weather controls. So for the 28 uh, day uh, death rate outcome, we're going to be controlling for the thousand contemporaneous indicators and then a thousand indicators for every day after that going out to 27 days, again, to be super careful about uh, our um, atmospheric controls. Now, let me talk briefly through what kind of variation we're capturing. Uh, so as you might have noticed, our first stage imposes a restriction that the effect of wind direction on pollution is identical across counties within a regional group. So even though we use the interpolated wind direction at each monitor, um, the effect of that wind direction has to be the same for all counties within that particular group. Now, this of course helps computationally, but it also removes variation from locally generated air pollution. So we wouldn't wanna capture variation where let's say there's a power plant in the middle of the county and an air pollution monitor to the east of the power plant. Uh, because in that case, what might happen is when the wind is blowing from the power plant to the pollution monitor, you see an increase in air pollution. When it's blowing away, you see a decrease. But for the county as a whole, uh, air pollution hasn't changed because the power plant is exactly in the middle of the county. So it just changes which half of the population gets exposed. That would be a form of measurement error that could bias our conclusions about the effects of air pollution on health. So by requiring that the coefficient on wind direction is the same for all counties in a monitor group, we're removing hopefully most of the variation from locally generated air pollution, leaving variation that's primarily coming from long range transport, which affects all parts of the county in the same way, which minimizes measurement error concerns. So the idea is that we're capturing air pollution that's blown in uh, from outside of the county and affects all parts of the county the same, giving us me uh, measure, uh, measure of air pollution that's free or almost free from measurement uh, error. Our estimate will have a late interpretation, which requires does require monotonicity assumption and we've done a number of checks in our previous paper that suggests that that monotonicity assumption uh, is met in our uh, data. Now, let me go through some summary statistics just to give you a sense of what daily death rates look like and what the air pollution concentrations in our sample look like. Um, average sulfur dioxide concentration in parts per billion is about nine in the sample. A uh, standard deviation is about 12.6. Uh, so one unit increase is slightly more than 10% of the mean, slightly less than 10, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, 10% of the mean, slightly less than 10% of a standard uh, deviation. And we have 2 million observations with sulfur dioxide readings. Now, we also obtain data on other pollutants um, like nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and ozone, which are available during our time period. A downside of these is that they're available for a much smaller subset of counties. Um, because in principle, we could instrument for all air pollutants uh, simultaneously. We have enough instruments. The way that these pollutants are transported and their sources varies. So we should have independent variation. Unfortunately, when we restrict our data to days when all four readings are available, we lose about 90% of our sample compared to sulfur uh, dioxide. So we leave that as a robustness check to make sure that our estimates of sulfur dioxide are not being driven by other pollutants getting blown in. Um, and for the most part, we just focus on sulfur dioxide. So the one day mortality rate in our sample for all causes and all ages is about 
per million individuals. And of course, over larger time periods, you just multiply that by the time period. So over 10 days, it would be about 247 uh, deaths per million. Uh, infant mortality over this time period is larger, about 33 deaths per million. That uh, has fallen substantially um, since that time. Um, younger people die at pretty low rates uh, here. And then as we get to the population that's 45 and older, the death rate picks up. So for ages 45 to 64, it's 27 deaths per million. For those 65 and older, it's 100 and um, almost 150 deaths per million. In this category, we're going to break up even further when we do our estimates. About half of the deaths are coming from cardiovascular causes, uh, 12 per day per million individuals. The rest are largely split between cancer and other internal causes, which includes things like diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease, and so on. And then we also have some external deaths, about 1.9 per uh, million. Okay, so now here are results of the acute effects of the effects of acute uh, sulfur dioxide uh, exposure. So every point here is one day. So we're basically expanding our K to look at the effect of a one day SO2 shock on the death rate over various time periods. So a same day SO2 shock raises the death rate by about 0.07. Uh, deaths per million. Um, and then why go out further? Well, one concern when you're looking at effects over such a short run period is whether these individuals would have died soon anyway. Um, and in that case, what we'd expect to see is as we expand the time period, our estimated effects should go to zero, right? Um, if all these individuals would have died within a month, uh, regardless of whether they experienced an increase in SO2 or not, then our 28-day effect should be zero. Instead, this effect is growing, which suggests that while there might be some mortality displacement, on net, uh, SO2 is having delayed effects where it's killing individuals uh, on days following the initial um, exposure. Um, so this suggests that a framework that has delayed mortality effects built into it is appropriate here. And I'll just briefly mention that our first stage of statistics here are very strong. They're all over 400. Um, so we're not worried about a weak instruments problem um, here. Now for comparison, let me show you the OLS results, what we get if we didn't instruments. Um, I put them on the same scale as the IV results. And so you can immediately notice that they are much smaller. Um, the 28 day effect is smaller than the one day effect we estimate with IV. Now, this might not be because of measurement error, but I think measurement error is a good suspect here that one reason that OLS results are biased is because of measurement error in pollution exposure versus changes in pollution at the monitor um, level. Uh, now let me show you deaths by cause. Um, to simplify things here, I'm just showing the seven-day estimate and the 28-day um, estimate. Uh, so most of the immediate deaths are coming or uh, from cardiovascular uh, causes, and that effect grows over time, almost doubling over the uh, between seven days and 28 days. We see a similar pattern with other. We also find an increase in cancer-related mortality. Now, the way to interpret this is that air pollution is killing individuals who were already fairly sick. You cannot develop and die from cancer um, over a seven-day uh, period. So most likely what's happening is this individuals already had fairly advanced cancer, and then the air, the pol air pollution exposure killed them, but they're cause of death was recorded as cancer anyway because of this underlying disease. And we also see not much going on with external, maybe a little bit here over 28 days, which could be indicating that uh, air pollution is having some cognitive effects, which has been shown uh, in the recent literature that um, lead to accidents and uh, so on. 
Okay, now let me show you the age specific effects. Um, and I'll, there will be a slide after this where you can see the confidence intervals for the younger ages. These are just 28 day mortality estimates. We don't find anything for infants, those that are less than one, although our confidence intervals are uh, fairly large here. Um, we also don't find any significant effects for individuals under 44 years of age. Starting at age 45, we start seeing significant increases in the death rate following SO2 exposure. Uh, and then these estimates really grow so that for those who are aged 85 and older, the 28 day mortality increases by six deaths per million as a result of a one day uh, SO2 shock. So there's clearly an age gradient here. However, this is not a complete picture because the elderly are dying at much higher rates anyway. So another way to view this is by normalizing this effect by the one day mortality of each age group, um, which still shows an increasing pattern, but not as stark as what you've seen in the previous graph. So again, we don't estimate uh, anything significant for those under the age of 45. We see a small uh, increase for 45 to 64 as a share of their baseline mortality and somewhat larger increases for older ages. And this is gonna be important when we interpret these um, estimates and plug them into our uh, structural um, model. There's a number of robustness checks that I'm happy to go over during the Q&A session, like instrumenting and controlling for other pollutants, parameterizing the weather controls in some other way, varying which fixed effects we include, um, using placebo wind directions as instruments, uh, using LIMO instead of um, 2SLS, and parametrizing our instrument in a different way. Uh, but I will um, get to, I, I, I wanna make sure that I get through um, the model. So this is a model of latent health developed by Yaris Mooney and Moreau 2019. Uh, we're adapting it to um, our setting um, a little bit, but for the most part, we're taking uh, their model. Uh, so this model posits that an individual's health at time T, uh, HD, is a function of their health in the previous period. A depreciation or aging parameter that's modeled as some constant delta times T to the alpha, where T you can think of as reflecting the age of the individual. Additionally, health is a function of some environmental resource I that's time invariant and does not depend on your age. And then some IID health shock that's normally distributed with mean zero and uh, variance sigma squared epsilon. You're born with a stock of health H naught, which is normally distributed with mean mu H and standard deviation sigma uh, H. Now, sigma H is not identified, so Yaris Mura, Mooney and Moreau uh, normalize it to one. So this model is meant to represent health parsimoniously. Uh, it has no individuals making uh, offsetting decisions or you know, investment in um, health, which is good for our setting because we don't think that people will necessarily respond to a one-day pollution shock by making investments at least over a very short time period. So when does death occur in this model? It occurs when health capital falls below some critical threshold H lower bar, which without loss of generality can be normalized to zero. So DT happens when HD falls below H lower bar, assuming you hadn't died up to this point. So it's a pretty simple model. But Yaris, Mooney, and Moreau show that it can capture a variety of real-world mortality dynamics. For example, the rectangularization of survival that we've seen uh, in humans uh, over the past um, uh, century or so. It can capture socioeconomic gradients. It can capture scarring effects where something doesn't kill you immediately but leads to higher mortality later on, which is exactly what we're interested in when it comes to long-run health effects of pollution. And it can also capture mortality displacement where a shock kills individuals that would have died soon uh, anyway. 
Um, importantly, this framework is useful for pollutants that have both immediate and delayed effects because this is fundamentally a dynamic model. So if I change one of these parameters for just one time period, it might kill some people instantly. Um, and that change in that parameter will have follow on consequences in later time periods, even if the change is itself temporary, because it will lower your health stock today, which will affect your health stock tomorrow. So to parameterize this model, we first fit it to um, this 1980 um, cohort. So basically we use cross-sectional mortality data to calibrate the model, which is pretty typical in this literature. Um, individuals who were uh, born in 1980 are largely still alive um, today. So if we want to think about the counterfactual mortality of a cohort from the time period of our sample, uh, we uh, should be using cross-sectional mortality data or some sort of modeling assumptions. And at this point, we prefer to use uh, cross-sectional mortality uh, data. So um, the blue line shows the actual survival of the 1980 cohort, which is again constructed by use, using cross-sectional mortality of different age groups in 1980. And the red uh, dashed line shows our model fit. Now, we're still working on improving our calibration um, code so that this fit can be made even better. But we're really, what we're really interested is deviations from the fit as a function of air pollution exposure, not necessarily the quality of the initial fit um, itself. OK, so now that we fitted this model, what do we do with it? Well, if we change alpha, delta, i, uh, sigma, epsilon, mu h, or h lower bar, this will change the mortality patterns over a cohort's lifetime. So there's a lot of parameters we could choose here, and we want to be careful because they will have different implications for the long-run mortality effects. Mu h controls the initial distribution of health. Um, as you saw, we don't see any evidence that infant mortality is affected by pollution, so we're not going to change mu h. Sigma epsilon is the variance of a mean zero IID health shock in each period. And so it's better for modeling heterogeneity um, within a specific group, which we're not interested in. So we're also not going to change sigma epsilon. What we're left with is alpha and delta. These parameterize the aging process. As I've mentioned, at least PM 2.5 and therefore sulfate has been implicated in playing an important role in the aging process. So these are promising uh, candidates. I can be used to model an equal sized shock for all ages. So it is also another promising candidate for us to um, alter. And finally, H lower bar can be used to model mortality displacement or um, so-called harvesting. Now, in the future, we do plan to do something with H lower bar just to probe the sensitivity of our estimates. But at this point, um, we are not um, we're not changing H um, lower bar. So, how do we determine whether to change the remaining three candidates, I, alpha, or delta? Here, I'm showing you the effect of changing each of these model parameters on the immediate mortality rate of people of different ages. So the x-axis has the age of these hypothetical simulated individuals. And then the lines show you what happens to their mortality if we decrease i or increase alpha or increase delta. Now, the scale on the y-axis doesn't matter because this is an arbitrarily sized shock. What matters is the age-specific patterns. So when we decrease I, that has the largest effect as a percent of the baseline mortality rate on the youngest individual, individuals. And then that declines with age. This is obviously not what we saw when we estimated the immediate mortality rate effects of sulfur dioxide. We saw that the relative mortality effects are, if anything, increasing with age which is exactly what we see with alpha and delta. And the intuition here for alpha and uh, delta is, of course, that they all are also a function of T, or that depreciation parameter is a function of T. 
So if I change alpha or delta for somebody whose T or whose age is very low, that's not going to have a large effect on their mortality rate. But if I change alpha or delta by the same amount for somebody who is substantially older, that will have a larger consequences for their stock of health and therefore for their mortality. Okay, so in order to translate our short run estimates into long run mortality, we do need to make some assumptions. So <clears throat> one assumption that we are gonna make is that the 28 day mortality effect we estimate are equal to the one year effects of a one day SO2 shock. So we're basically assuming that there are no further delayed effects and no mortality displacement within the year so that the 28 day estimates are stable. Now, the reason we don't go beyond 28 days in our um, empirical framework is because it's computationally intensive to do so because we're controlling for all future weather conditions. We're currently working on relaxing um, the weather controls a little bit um, in a way that doesn't have a meaningful effect on our 28-day uh, estimates. Um, and then uh, that should allow us to go out further, perhaps 90 days, just to verify that there's no um, mortality displacement or further delay effects uh, happening. But for now, we're assuming that the 28-day mortality effect is uh, the same as a one-year effect. We're also making a linearity assumption that the effect of a one-year increase in SO2 is just 365 times the effect of a one-day SO2 shock. Now, this is also something that we can test for uh, in our data. So we can test whether interactions between SO2 today and SO2 yesterday matter for mortality, controlling for the SO2 shocks um, themselves and uh, incorporated into our model appropriately. I should also mention that um, linearity is an assumption that a lot of studies of pollution implicitly make when they look at the effects of a pollution average over some period of time, right? When you're looking at an average, you are ignoring uh, the fact that that average might be a function of um, really high and really low pollution days, or it might be driven by, you know, sort of equally sized pollution shocks, right? By not distinguishing between those two cases, you're implicitly making a linearity assumption. Obviously, we're making the assumption that this dynamic production model of health adequately describes long-run changes uh, in survival. Um, this potentially is a limitation, but at the same time, this model is much more flexible than, for example, the Gompertz model of uh, mortality. So it's kind of the state of the art when it comes to um, survival uh, model and production models of health. Um, and finally, uh, we're also making the assumption that SO2 affects mortality through a single model uh, parameter, which is also an assumption that we can relax in future work. Um, so what does, what does our model um, tell us? Here I'm showing you the effect of a one unit increase in SO2 on cohort survival. So the bright blue line is the baseline survival curve which you saw when I showed you the fitted line. And then the dashed lines are various counterfactuals for what survival would have been like, according to our model, if SO2 had been one unit higher. So essentially what we're doing, for example, when we look at the change in I, is we look at our 28 day estimates for every different age group. And then we ask, what change in I would rationalize these increases in one year mortality? Then we impose that change in I in the model. Um, and then we simulate the model forward to get at the long run delayed effects. So we're basically using our short run estimates to inform the change in the underlying model parameters. And then once we have the change in the underlying model parameters, we can do counterfactual simulations for an arbitrary um, amount of pollution shocks, duration, uh, and so on. And we do the same for delta and alpha, asking ourselves what change in delta would rationalize the mortality increase that we see with our quasi-experimental estimates. 
and then imposing that change in uh, delta or alpha going forward. I should also say that we can't really tell between delta and alpha because they behave so similarly in this model, but they also give us very similar conclusions about the effects, the long run mortality effects of SO2 changes. So we don't particularly care between distinguishing between them. What does give us quite different predictions is I versus delta or alpha. So our baseline life expectancy in this model is 74.8 years. Um, if we model changes in health as a result of air pollution exposure as coming through alpha or delta, we get very similar counterfactual life expectancies of 74.1 or 74.2 um, years. So basically a 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 year reduction in life expectancy. If we instead suppose that I changes, we get a much a uh, larger drop in life expectancy of 72.7 years, um, which is not uh, realistic. So that just demonstrates the importance of thinking about which parameter to change. And this also lines up nicely with the fact that we actually don't think changing I is the right thing to do in our setting because of the patterns, the age specific patterns that we see when it comes to um, SO2 uh, effects. And I also want to point out here that um, the survival curves differ most here at older ages. So even though we're saying now that younger people also experience a change in alpha or delta as a result of air pollution exposure, their health stock is just too high for that to cause them to die at the young ages, right? Um, and that's exactly how we think air pollution operates. So this model is also giving us realistic predictions or what we think are realistic predictions about when pollution kills you in the long run and not at age 20, um, even if you've been exposed at a young age, but perhaps uh, at age 60 rather than age, um, rather than age 65. Okay. So um, that's what um, I have for you today. Uh, just to recap the most important findings, uh, we find that a one day, one part per billion increase in SO2 leads to about 0 0.18 additional deaths per million over the next 28 days. Um, the vast majority of these deaths are coming from the elderly dying and are due to cardiovascular causes. Um, as I've shown you, between 1972 and 2015, SO2 levels have declined almost tenfold. And even though our, these estimates are still preliminary, they hint at the economic benefits of this reduction being large. Um, our estimates suggest that a one unit permanent decrease in SO2 improves life expectancy by 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 years by improving survival at older ages. Now, obviously, the decline in SO2 was much larger over this time period than one unit. Um, so there are a couple of things to say to that. First, um, you, we can't just multiply our estimate by the change in SO2, right? So if you wanted a 10 unit change, um, that right answer would not be to just multiply 0 0.6 by 10. Because this model is highly nonlinear, we have to actually plug in that change into our model. Uh, second, the reduction in SO2 has been gradual over this time period, and that's also what we want to model. Um, so the benefits of a gradual reduction are obviously going to be more delayed than the benefits of an immediate reduction. So some of these benefits, at least if you believe our model, haven't even been realized yet because they happened um, to, you know, in the 1980s or so um, to individuals who were perhaps then in their 20s or even younger and are just now reaching their retirement uh, ages. So uh, their benefits of air pollution reductions may not have been uh, experienced yet. Uh, and I look forward to updating you with what we predict these benefits to be. And I will um, stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you for your uh, nice and clear presentation. I don't know if you can see me. Yes. 
Yes, should can. I stop sharing my screen um, or should I keep it up in case people want me to um, go back to something? That, that's the same. I think you can keep... Uh, you, can, you can leave it there, maybe. Yeah. Better. Um, so we can now open the discussion. Um, it would be nice to start with some questions from our PhD students. So uh, guys, if you have questions, I'm very happy to give you priority. Um, so let me also look at the chat if there are questions. No questions, and then while I can start, uh, I have a couple of um, questions and clarifications for you, Tatiana. Oh, is it in the chat? Where's my chat? Uh, Let me see here. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh. I don't see any uh, raised hands, so maybe I can start asking my, my questions. Uh, so, Tatiana, um, I think this is a very um, interesting world that pushed a um, little bit high the, the, the frontier of the pollution uh, research. Um, I have a couple of questions, especially on two aspects that I'm going to tell you. Um, Regarding the experimental setting using uh, wind speed and direction, you know that uh, this is a quite standard setting that you already used in a famous paper, and it was extensively used also in other papers. Um, but um, I don't know if the I collect this question from um, Nicolò. I don't know if Nicolò is still attending, but uh, I can. Uh, I can say this question. Um, maybe is there a risk that people uh, during uh, windy days uh, maybe move less and reducing their exposure? I mean, can you uh, can you test for um, stormy windy days uh, in order to uh, check if uh, there is a nonlinear effect? Yeah, so um, just to clarify, we actually only use wind direction and not wind speed as an instrument, partly because of this exact um, concern. Um, and, and we control for wind speed. Now, our estimates don't change uh, much regardless of whether or not we control for wind speed, which suggests that wind speed and wind direction are either not sufficiently correlated to affect our estimates or um, that, you know, the wind itself doesn't have independent mortality effects. Um, but we are not worried about wind speed precisely because it's not part of our instrument. It's just wind direction. And, you know, it's much more plausible to assume that people don't change their behavior um, as a function of wind direction itself, right? They might change their behavior in response to greater pollution, but the wind direction itself shouldn't matter yeah. on average. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I have another clarification. Is there a specific reason why you don't include uh, PM in your, maybe I lost this detail, but is there a specific reason why you don't include PM, either PM 2.5 or 10 in your political set? Yeah, so um, PM 2.5 was not monitored in the United States until 1999 um, outside of our sample, with, with very few exceptions, definitely not before 1992. Um, now we do have, um, there's total suspended particulates that's, uh, that is available. Um, but one difficulty with using total suspended particulates and SO2 um, is that SO2 converts to um, sulfate, which is a component of um, total suspended particulates. So um, they're, they're basically hard to tell apart precisely because one becomes um, the other. Uh, so we don't, um, we also don't try to control for uh, total suspended particulates for that reason. Okay, because uh, so can we say that uh, your estimates constitute basically a lower bound, uh, not accounting for uh, extra effect due to particulate matter? 
I would say that fine particulate matter is a mechanism through which these health effects could materialize. I think that's the best way to interpret um, our estimates. Um, be, right, because, you know, for example, the seven day effect we estimate, some of that could be due to the SO2 that's getting blown in, converting to sulfate, and then harming your health uh, in that way. That doesn't necessarily make it a lower bound. That's just, you know, the mechanism through which SO2 affects you. Uh, and it's still a policy relevant uh, quantity in the sense that if you reduce sulfur dioxide emissions, you will also reduce the amount of sulfate that people end up getting um, exposed mm -hmm. to. So you should think of sulfur dioxide as being a bundle um, of sulfur dioxide and sulfate. Uh, and that bundle can change uh, a bit over time. Okay. And um, regarding the sulfur dioxide pollutant, you know that this represents mainly um, uh, an industry-specific pollutant, okay? There's not something that comes basically from, from urban area. It comes mostly from, from more uh, non-urban area, let's say. Um, did you run any uh, effects that originated to test if this effect comes more from uh, non-urban areas and more industrialized areas? So we know that a lot of the sulfur dioxide in our sample is coming from um, coal-fired power plants. They're definitely the largest emitters of SO2 over this time period. Yeah, um, yeah, but it is getting, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is getting blown into urban uh, areas. Um, as we saw, and in particular, this is a well-known problem in the United States that the Midwest has a lot of um, coal-fired power plants. Mm -hmm. And because of the wind patterns, a lot of the sulfur dioxide and other emissions ends up on the East Coast, uh, you know, in cities like New York and um, Philadelphia. And again, this was a bigger problem in the 1970s uh, and, uh, and 80s. Um, so in terms of what this is relevant for, um, there's uh, China and India are still using a lot of coal-fired power plants. So these specific estimates should be informative uh, for that purpose. Um, and our general methodology, of course, can be applied to uh, any uh, pollutant. Um, now, in terms of uh, heterogeneity, uh, we've actually done some heterogeneity analysis that's not uh, in the paper where we look at um, heterogeneity by uh, income and by average SO2 concentrations, mm -hmm. which um, the SO2 concentrations will proxy for urban versus rural. Uh, and we actually see that the effects of SO2 are um, higher at lower concentrations. Um, so kind of suggesting a concave damage curve, but of course there could be a, a bunch of um, unobserved determinants of this uh, heterogeneity. So that would suggest that, um, you know, in urban areas, the effects are somewhat lower, but we haven't done an ur urban rural test directly. Um, I, I should also mention that, uh, you know, here we have a map of where the monitors are. Uh, and so white counties are those that don't have any um, monitors. The monitors are disproportionately concentrated in urban areas. So all these white counties, they're pretty sparsely populated. And that's partly because monitor, they prioritize monitor places, placement in places that do have a lot of the pollutant. Um, and that happens to be um, urban, uh, urban areas. Okay, but regarding the monitors, um, you mentioned that you, you used um, a clustering algorithms to, 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 to group basically monitors uh, in, a, in a specific area. Can you say something more about this uh, clustering algorithm? Yeah, so it's just k-means clustering where we feed the longitude and latitude of each monitor to the algorithm and ask it to assign it in different groups. And the colors you see here are actually the um, groups that we end up with. Um, we ran out of colors, so some colors repeat, um, but uh, basically when this, this green is one monitor group, this 
blue is another um, monitor group. This yellow is another um, monitor group. Okay. And these are, this is the Chicago group that you saw, and this is the Los Angeles uh, group that you saw. Uh, basically, what, what are the main characteristics of each group? So what's the, uh, the, the common characteristics to, to, to create a group? It's purely geographic proximity. Purely geographic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no, it, literally the only input is latitude and long, longitude of each um, monitor. Okay, no altitude or orographic condition. No. Okay. okay. And, and these monitors, I mean, you know, there there is some evidence that there's some strategic monitor placement, but for the most part, um, the EPA does try to place them near where people live. You know, they won't place them right to one side of a highway or any like they don't they they're trying to get as unbiased of a reading as uh, possible. But these are different from weather stations. A lot of weather stations are located at airports. Um, you're not going to find pollution monitors located. Uh, well, not at least not for the purposes of uh, monitoring um, counties for compliance with EPA, because EPA understands that they want something that's more representative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, why did you say that um, coarser um, wind grid data help uh, estimate the effects? Because you, uh, I saw that you have uh, quite coarse grid data of about 100, and, no, maybe less, uh, 1.25 degree. Or is yeah. It yeah. So, so the potential fall uh, drawback of this coarse wind data is you might not pick up any pollution transport, right? So your first stage will be um, just totally insignificant because you're not picking up the relevant wind patterns. That doesn't happen in our data. Um, a positive um, that, yeah, maybe I, I forgot to go into detail about is that these the scores grid is largely reflecting uh, regional wind patterns rather than very local wind patterns, right? So. Um, you know, kind of the power plant example I gave, you know, let, let's take um, like this um, pollution monitor, which is in one um, part of the county. Um, if there's a pollution source right here in the middle uh, and uh, it gets, it, it blows um, the pollution over here uh, on one day, but blows it over here on the other day, like for the average person in the county, if they're evenly distributed, the pollution concentrations might not change, but you will pick it up uh, in the first stage. I guess that's more to do actually with restricting coefficients to be the same, but a, a benefit of not having highly localized wind direction is, um, is that wind patterns could be highly nonlinear. And so if you do have wind direction at this monitor specifically, um, the, it might kind of curve over here or over here. So it's not really clear what you're going to be picking up if you're using something that's, that's highly localized. It might not allow you to capture regional transport patterns that you'd really want to capture. Okay. Okay, so um, that's all from, from my side. Okay. So um, are there any other questions? You, you, have a, you have a question on the chat from uh, Adelia, who might raise her point directly. I think that she can, she can talk. And yes, also, Adelia. Please, Adelia. Adelia, go ahead. She, she wrote oh. something in the chat. I don't know whether oh. she can talk. I, uh, well, uh, basically, it's the same question. Maybe I have missed it. Uh, do you understand correctly that you control for precipitation also? Yeah. OK. Uh yeah, so we control for precipitation. We basically, um, our baseline controls for precipitation are fairly coarse. Um, we control for precipitation being below the 75th percentile, between 75th and 95th percentile, 95th to 99th, and then above the um, 99th. And so basically, the first one captures little or no precipitation. This is a small amount of precipitation, moderate amount of precipitation, and extreme precipitation. And these, um, exactly what the level is, um, depends on 
um, the county. So these percentile cutoffs are county um, specific. So what's a lot of precipitation for one county might be um, different for another county. And then we do um, have uh, different parameterizations of um, weather controls. So these are, and I, I haven't even shown all of the possibility. These are baseline ones, and this is just one day um, mortality. This is dropping all weather controls. This is where we control for um, um, bins of temperatures. So three degrees Celsius bins instead of percentiles. And we control for deciles of precipitation and wind speed. And then we form all pairwise um, interactions. And then um, we obtain very, you know, almost indistinguishable estimate. And this is where we just don't do any interactions. So the weather controls, even though they could matter in principle, um, they don't matter much um, in practice. And then our placebo uh, is a little bit different. It's not quite randomizing. It's not randomizing um, monitor placement. Um, we could try to reassign uh, pollution, um, but you know the biggest concern that people have with the instrument is like you just have so many of them. What if this is just some artifact of having two hundred um, instruments? Uh, and so to address that, we generate random wind directions as instruments. Um, we uh, process them in the same way that we process our uh, normal wind direction. And, he, and we basically obtain really low um, F statistics. So the strength of our instrument is not being driven by the fact that we just have many of them. And of course here, the second stage coefficients are not informative because um, it's just, you know, they're super weak uh, instruments. So that's a placebo test that we do. Thank you. Okay, Tatiana, now there's a question from Gianluca. Gianluca. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Tatiana, for, for the presentation. I have, I have one curiosity about, uh, uh, about long-term uh, exposures of areas to, to pollution. If, if, you, if you tried some um, heterogeneity test on that, if, if this, uh, the effect of, of, of the shock could be higher on uh, areas where uh, there are long-term uh, long exposures to, to pollution or not, just a curiosity. You mean in the model or empirically? Empirically, yeah. Okay, yes, so, um, so we did look at um, heterogeneity by average SO2 levels. Um, it, you know, basically, do you live in above median or below median um, county by SO2 exposure? And what we found is that the marginal effect of a um, SO2 shock uh, is higher in places with lower concentrations of SO2. So if you were to take this seriously in terms of the damage curve, it would imply that the damage curve is concave. So basically the higher um, air pollution concentration is, the less damage an additional unit of SO2 causes. The problem in interpreting it that way is that areas with lower levels of SO2 are just different on um, all sorts of basically any dimension you can look at, population, income, um, share minority, and so on. Um, so that could be picking up some of that heterogeneity. Um, another concern is sorting, right? So this is one reason why studies of long-run exposure and long-run uh, pollution run into trouble either um, you know, by interpreting correlations as causal or when trying to get quasi-experimental variation is if like, for example, the sick people leave the more polluted areas, then you might also predict that in the less polluted areas where there is more vulnerable people, um, uh, SO2 shock does more, does more damage. So there could be important population heterogeneity driven by sorting in this kind of exercise. But the short answer is, um, it, we've done that and, um, you know, it, it's, uh, the damages are higher at lower, in places with lower concentrations. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Alessandro, question? Uh, can I ask something? I, I forgot to raise my hand. Can I? I? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Sandro. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tatiana. Very, very interesting paper, <clears throat> indeed. Um, 
I, I've got a question about this uh, uh, fantastic uh, instrument that, that you propose and you use. Uh, so as a question somehow related to the concern that Alessandro had at the very beginning to which you reply that basically you focus on, on the, you, you just consider the direction of wind that you do not take into account the speed. Uh, however, uh, I mean, it might be a trivial, uh, a trivial point. Uh, you, you, you are able to measure direction providing wind is fast enough. I mean, providing there's, there's enough wind. So my concern is uh, about the extent to which this instrument could be uh, extended or replicated somewhere else where uh, the speed of the wind is not large enough to, to detect uh, a considerable direction. So it is a more general question to be sure about the replicability of mm. this kind of, of very particular instrument in, in, other, in, other geographical, in other geographical context. And, and, and another question is still in terms of replicability, maybe you, have, you already touched this and I might miss it in that case, apologies. Uh, to which extent this uh, high predictability uh, of the direction of wind with respect to SO2 extends to other pollutants, or whether there's a certain heterogeneity in the extent to which pollutants get transported uh, or affected by wind. Yeah, um, I touched I very quickly, only talked about that. Um, yeah, so in terms of low wind speeds, um, this is another um, benefit of using a large grid. Um, so these reanalysis data are based on, um, reanalysis data in general just means somebody's put together a number of different data sets and combine them in a way to get um, data that's better than any single data set together. So um, the Japanese um, uh, agency, meteorological agency, uh, uses a number of data sets, which to be honest, I, I don't remember what all of them are to put together these, um, these wind data. Uh, again, the grid is very coarse. I actually should know how many um, points have zero wind speeds, but my guess is it is very few because these are reflecting regional uh, patterns. And it's very hard to imagine that over a large geographic scale, you know, 140 um, kilometers, you're gonna get wind um, speed that's close to zero, right? Because it can't be negative. So uh, as long as there is any positive wind speed, um, it will inform um, these things. Now, it is true that in other settings, um, you know, wind direction might be less predictive of air pollution for whatever reason. I don't, I don't think it would be necessarily because of the wind speed, again, because of the nature of the data. Um, but that, that is um, an empirical um, question for, for people to grapple with. I mean, you know, the U.S. itself is fairly heterogeneous and we see a strong um, relationship and a variation in, in wind direction kind of um, in many parts um, of the country. Um, and then on your question on other pollutants, so yes, theoretically, um, you can instrument for all of them separately because um, they're emitted in different places. Um, some of them are transported faster than others. Some of them react with um, other uh, molecules in the atmosphere faster uh, than others. So the wind direction should have an independent predicted effect uh, of, of different pollutants. Um, so we've done that um, kind of as a, as a robustness check. Um, and here um, you see that uh, our observations is much larger, so or much smaller, just 272,000. And I apologize that the F statistics are missing. Um, I'm not sure what happened there, but we do we do still have strong uh, enough um, uh, F statistics here. Um, so here I've just restricted it to the same sample for comparability, um, and you see that you know the biggest other pollutant that shows up here. Um, I actually, I guess that they all um, show up potentially significant is NO2, um, mm -hmm. which is typically co-emitted with SO2. It's another um, um, power plant byproduct. Um, and it also converts to fine uh, particulate matter uh, to a different um, 
type of fine particulate matter uh, over time. So that's that could be another part of the um, bundle here. Um, we find uh, also that uh, CO uh, plays a role, but it appears to be quite independent from uh, SO2 carbon monoxide. Again, th that one makes sense because it's emitted by uh, different sources. And then this negative um, coefficient on ozone is interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the negative coefficient of ozone, um, which uh, other papers have actually found uh, that instrument, um, is potentially because there's other pollutants that are negatively correlated with ozone um, that are, um, are being um, picked up here. But the ozone itself doesn't affect um, the SO2 a mortality relationship. The biggest other contributor that you know potentially feeds in here is uh, NO2. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, do we have other questions? I don't think so. Um, Tatiana, last question. Um, let me think about this. Um, you know that, um, I mean, as we suppose that when the wind blows, uh, it affects um, all the people to the same extent, okay? Um, but are you concerned about possible avoidance behavior? I mean, um, do, do you see any concern um, on this instrument for possible um, underestimation due to avoidance behavior? Yeah, so I, I, well, you, one might um, argue about whether, yeah, I guess it, it would be under underestimation of the health effect in a similar way that um, countervailing investments would be um, over um, underestimating. It's really hard to say, um, you know, on one hand, the changes in pollution are not small. So as I've mentioned, you know, we have differences of three parts per billion uh, between the largest and the smallest in some cases, um, which could potentially generate, um, you know, changes in pollution that are uh, noticeable um, to people. Um, but on the other hand, this is wind direction. And so, you know, do people look at the wind direction, especially during that time period and make their decisions based on which way the wind is blowing from? That uh, seems less likely. So we can't rule out avoidance behavior just because we don't have any data from that um, time period on what people um, do. But um, I think probably in this setting, avoidance behavior is very is the least likely of other quasi-experimental um, variation, just because of the nature of the variation we're using. But that's ultimately it's it's a hard it's a hard to answer question. Yeah, no, I, I know perfectly. Um, I, I'm asking this because I was quite surprised, surprised let's say, um, um, on the uh, monotonic effect um, across uh, different age classes, uh, because there's, um, I mean, it's a linear effect. And uh, if you remember in the paper with Joanna, uh, using a transport uh, strike, uh, we are somehow able to, 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 to disentangle the effect between younger people and the elderly. And in that case, there's, there's a different cost uh, opportunity um, to uh, people because younger people, for instance, have to attend school, go to work, etc. cetera. Yeah. Uh, we found a fact also for younger people, quite large effect, uh, and uh, uh, as well, we found a fact for, for the elderly. So uh, that's why I'm asking about to what extent um, these instruments might just uh, underestimate this kind of avoidance behavior. Uh, but I mean, the, it's not a matter of the instruments. I, mean, I, I take the instrument, but the extent wind affects all the people to the same uh, way, uh, it might have also some heterogeneity across age classes. Yeah, so certainly um, perhaps not so much across age classes, but I would think the most plausible thing are um, people with chronic health conditions who 
which are exacerbated by air pollution. So those, because really to undertake avoidance behavior in response to this, um, you have to be monitoring um, the pollution, I think, and, and basically not go out on days with um, high enough pollution levels. Um, I don't even know if it was feasible for people to do that during that time period because you know there was no internet. Um, maybe you could listen on the radio, but I would think here the avoidance behavior would be like by people who monitor pollution on a daily basis, which would probably be individuals who are um, uh, yeah, susceptible yeah, more, more to, it. Yeah. to this issue, of course. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, do, do you think that? Uh, the largest part of the um, absence of effect in younger people is due to the fact that younger people has stronger uh, predetermined health status? Um, yeah, I would think probably. I mean... Because um, the fact that wind affects all people to the same extent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I think it makes sense that the young individuals, like, because we're looking at a very extreme outcome, right? We're not looking at hospitalizations here or um, medication. So it's possible that for younger people, there are effects. They're just not mortality. Um, so what we're estimating is that younger people aren't dying as a result of this shock, which I think is quite plausible. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure. Because you, you, yes, yes, your outcome is mortality. So it makes perfectly sense that it affects only I mean, uh, older individuals. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, and, and you know, it would be great if we had hospitalization or medication data, but it's just not um, not readily available or not available over this time period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so if there are no uh, other questions, uh, I think we can uh, close. Uh, is there any other question? No. Okay. Okay, Tatiana, so um, thank you once again for uh, accepting our invitation. Thank you for the great presentation. And I hope we can uh, invite you uh, once again, maybe uh, physically, but hopefully yes. uh, soon. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for having me out here and for your great questions and uh, comments. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, for you very much, Tatiana. Thank you indeed. Hope to see you soon yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yes, I hope so too. Okay. Not on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, 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 indeed. Thank you very much for having participated um, to this series. It was really a, a great paper on a great topic. Really, really fascinating and extremely relevant. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.